ready to worship the Lord this morning? Let me hear you. Yeah. yeah. Come on, we're going to sing it out. We're gonna see. I 
how great you are, God. Good morning, LC3. How are y'all doing this morning? Awesome. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, we're so glad to have you here this morning. As you can see on the screen, we've got a lot going on this week, and it's just a great time to get involved here with us at LC3. No doubt about that. And coming up this Friday, September 27th, will be exactly 40 days before Election Day. If you would be willing to commit to praying each day on your own during those 40 days, uh, be sure to see Jim or Sandy in the lobby following the service this morning. Yeah, and also you can help bring Christmas to kids all around the world. We have a packing party coming up September 28th from 10 a.m. to noon. And you don't need to sign up for this. You can just come out and help us. It's going to be a great time of fellowship and being able just to spread that Christmas spirit all around the world. That's right. That's right. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we love Operation Christmas Child. There's no doubt about it. Uh, if you bought tickets, remember God's Trombones production is this Saturday at 6 p.m. at Timberlake Baptist Church. And if you didn't buy tickets yet, you can purchase tickets at the door, maybe arrive a little bit early to get those settled. I think you're going to enjoy that production this Saturday. Also at Timberlake Baptist Church is our Fellowship Wednesday free lunch between 11.30 p.m. and 1 p.m. Um, it's always the last Wednesday of the month, and we just love for you to come out to that. Definitely. Also on the last Wednesday of the month is our Wednesday Praise and Prayer. However, that's here at LC3 at 6 p.m. again this Wednesday. Check out this video to learn more about this ministry from Jim Sixai. Yeah. Hello, LC3 family. My name is Jim Sixai. I am deacon here at LC3, and I have the privilege and blessing of leading our monthly praise and prayer service on the last Wednesday of each month. I could say a lot about how wonderful our praise and prayer services have been, but I'm going to let the Word of God encourage you to attend. Psalm 34.3 says, Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. Psalm 22.3 says, God inhabits the praises of His people. He enjoys to be praised. How much more if we do it together? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18 says, Rejoice or praise always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Think about that. It is the will of God for us to praise Him and to pray to Him without ceasing. Hebrews 10, 24 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love in good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another, and so much more as we see the day approaching. We invite you to come and join us to be encouraged and blessed on the last Wednesday of each month as we meet with our Heavenly Father for a special time of praise and prayer. Hope to see you then. God bless you. Very cool, yes. If you have additional questions about that, you can see Jim. Uh, in the lobby following the service this morning. Yeah, and we just want to say that we're so great that all of you came out here this morning. Um, if you're a reoccurring guest here with us at LC3, we'd love for you to reach into that seat back pocket in front of you and pull out the white connection card. You can also scan the QR code on the screen with your phone, or you can go to lc3church.com and just make sure that you can fill it out and put your prayer request on there. We would love to pray for you. For sure. And if this is your first time here this morning, and we're so glad you're here. By the way, my name's Austin Bond. I'm glad to meet you. And this is Kaylee Edwards. And uh, y'all yeah, give it up for Kaylee helping out with announcements this morning, Allison. <laughs> Kaylee and her father, Bobby, also teach the Deeper Dive class at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. So if you ever want to spend a little more time with it, yeah, there you go. <laughs> we got a great group coming out for that every Sunday morning. Well, again, I was saying, if you're a first-time guest, we're glad you're here. Welcome. In the seat back pocket in front of you is a green uh, connection card. If you could reach out and fill out that card and then take it to the guest booth in the lobby, they have a special gift for you today. Yeah, and here at LC3, we don't believe in passing a plate. We just don't want you to give because you feel compelled to because the person beside you gave. We believe that's something that should be between you and God. You can give um, in the tithe box tithe boxes that you may have seen when you entered this morning, or you can give safely at lc3church.com. And on the screen, you see an address. You can mail in a check there. Just we want that to be something between you and God. Yeah, definitely. And again, uh, as we continue with worship, we, you know, we talked about worship through giving. Uh, as we continue with worship through song, uh, we kind of dim the lights, and we do that just really to help 
reduce distractions as you continue to worship God. We want you to feel free to stand up, reach out, lift your hands up to God, to maybe come down front, pray the altar, uh, sit in your seat, and re reflect, pray to God. I mean, this is your time with God. We want you to use it uh, to the max. Um, also wanted to mention communion is located also at tables as you entered into the auditorium this morning. Anytime during the next song you'd like to get up and um, partake in communion to mirror what Jesus did on the cross, you are more than welcome to do that. As, we, uh, as Kaylee leads us in prayer in, uh, in a minute, I did want to mention that we want to pray for Bree Frick and her family and friends. She's dealing with uh, just it's a tough time for her health. There's just no other words to say anything extremely tough. And so we uh, ask that you will also uh, lift her up and her family and friends. Uh, some of y'all may know her. She was a teacher at St. James Elementary School a while back. So, um, Kaylee, would you lead us in prayer? Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we could all come here today. I just pray for Brie Frick and her family and friends that you would wrap your loving arms around them during this time. I also pray for Pastor Isaac as he gives us the message today that you would speak through him. And just thank you once again for these Sundays where we get to fellowship with you and with the people around us. And let us be lights to people in this world. And just now I pray, amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship. One of the things I love to do is to sing about the names of Jesus. Did you guys know how many names God the Father has? Too many to list here today, but here are a few of our favorites. Heavenly Father, Prince of Peace, Counselor, risen with healing in your
bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There are a lot of names to call on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But every once in a while on this journey, we had a darkness in our life. And it reminds me of when I was a child, and we went and visited this cave. And my mom is holding my hand and my sisters, and my dad is carrying my little brother, who was probably about three at the time. And we go down into this cave, and the gentleman leading us down, the guide had on his hard hat with his headlamp. And he's telling us all about the cave. And as a child, I'm not really paying attention to what he's saying because I'm fascinated with what's going on. But I heard him say something about turning the light off and it becoming dark. It's got my attention. And he says, it's going to become so dark that you won't be able to see your hand in front of your face. So he turns off the light. And I, of course, put my hand here and I'm touching my nose. I can't see my fingers. My brother, I hear him say, Dad. Where'd you go? My dad kind of chuckles and he goes, son, I'm holding you still. I never left. As a child of God, sometimes life gets so dark and we say, God, where are you? He says, child, I'm holding you. Because he's always right here. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you.
you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Father, we thank you for who you are to us today. Just a few of the names we got to sing, to bless you, that describe you so much more than our hearts and heads can understand, but it's a good start. Well, Lord, we just praise you today. We thank you for the privilege of being here to be able to hear your word. We love you, Lord. Do you guys love him? Yes. And what did we say? Amen. It begins with openness. The willingness to come alongside someone else. To pour out. Care. Invest. It's about sharing the journey, doing life together, growing, forging, becoming. It's about selflessness, caring enough to walk through the valley, even when it's painful, to love people as Christ has loved us. It's rejoicing when they rejoice, hurting when they hurt, being a hand, an encourager, a friend. We were not created to wander alone. For as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I'm going to go ahead and start us off with a nice spicy question this morning. And I am looking for participation, so help me out here, okay? I want to know what comes to your mind when you hear the term administrative segregation. Anybody? What's that? Not hearing anything. Anything at all. We can wait. All right. Let me tell you what I think. When I hear the term segregation, I think racism, something racist. I grew up 
in a time, thankfully, not during segregation. It was afterwards. I learned about that in a history book. I didn't have to experience it. So that's good for me. But again, that term is always something that's going to sound to me like racism. So especially when I hear that term preceded by administrative, it sounds like like an orchestrated or a systematic kind of racism. But here's the good thing. It's not that deep. Here's what administrative segregation actually is. It's solitary confinement. Do you guys see how different the truth is compared to what I thought it was when I just heard the term? And that can be really, really impactful when the term is church. So over these next four weeks, we are going to hear four separate messages from this uh, sermon series, We Are Gathered Here. And each one of these messages has its own goal for our lives. But I want you to gather a total goal from all four messages so that by the end of it, you are better able to articulate what the church is supposed to be to people who are unbelievers, to people who have been hurt by other people in the church, and to your fellow Christians. And by the way, not just articulate it either. Actually be able to live it out. Because there are people in all those categories that I can imagine feel a totally different thing when they just hear the term church. If they don't understand what the church is actually meant to be, what it's meant to do, how it's supposed to operate, then their minds are going to continue to take them down a path similar to mine that may be even worse than me thinking administrative segregation has anything to do with racism when it's actually just solitary confinement. And while we're talking about solitary I want to ask you this. Who gets put into solitary confinement? Prisoners, criminals, and really bad ones at that. It's a form of punishment for society's worst examples. I don't know what keeps going on there, but we'll get through it. So it's, it's used as a form of punishment for society's worst examples. So I want you to think about that while I read this small quote here from an article published in 2012 by the American Psychological Association. It says, quote, deprived of normal human interaction, many segregated prisoners reportedly suffer from mental health problems, including anxiety, panic, insomnia, paranoia, aggression, and depression, end quote. And then later on it says, Quote, evidence of these effects comes as no surprise. It borders on being common sense, but it's common sense with a, a lot of empirical data that supports it. So much of what we do and who we are is rooted in a social context, end quote. Let me say that one more time. So much of what we do and who we are is rooted in a social context. And that is so true. Guys, when we remove the social factor, things go haywire. Look at the effects that it has. This article was written in 2012, way before the pandemic. We experienced firsthand what the pandemic did to us. We saw these things happening in real time just a few years ago. But now that we're out of that, why do we keep putting ourselves in that same compromised position? Why do we keep isolating ourselves from the community that God gave us to nurture us? Why would we do that? It's detrimental to our health in so many ways. It's literally a form of punishment for criminals. Why do we do that to ourselves? God has something so much better for us planned here on this earth. And today we're going to look at the church's role in gathering together for encouragement. That would be the title of the sermon. So let's pray and we'll get started. God, we just want to come to you and say thank you for allowing us to be here. 
And I pray that you would just step into this room, uh, fill our minds and our eyes and our ears and our hearts with your word. Help us to understand it as we read it. Help us to apply it to our lives and let it change us to be more like you. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hebrews is an excellent book. Unfortunately, uh, we can't be 100% sure who wrote it, whether it was Paul or someone else, but this book contains a ton of information about Jesus Christ. It makes huge claims about the person of Jesus, and its overwhelming theme is Jesus' supremacy. That is, he is better than everything else that came before him, including the law, the prophets, the old sacrifices, all of that. Jesus completely changes everything for those who claim to believe in the one true God. And that message is highlighted once again in the first half of chapter 10, which we won't be in the first half today. But I want you to understand that the first half of chapter 10 makes the second half of chapter 10 possible. So we're going to pick up in verse 19, which starts with, Therefore, and we've heard us talk about that before. All the things before verse 19 gives the reason why 19 and following can be stated. Things like the law cannot make you perfect. Sacrifices are insufficient and they needed to be repeated year after year. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. Priests cannot take away sins. But in contrast to all of that, Jesus only needed to be sacrificed one time. It was only his body and his blood that could wash away our sins. And it is the only sacrifice that you will ever need for all time. So with that fresh in your minds, let's go ahead and read what comes next. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus... By a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And... Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And guys, as I read through this passage and I was studying for this message, there were five quick things that jumped out at me that we can do. There's four do's and one don't. So we're going to take some time and go through these five things right here. Confidently draw near to God's throne. Firmly grasp our hope. Provoke each other to love and good works. That's a fun one. Don't stop meeting together. And again, the title of this sermon series, our sermon, is Encourage One Another. And then as we go through each of these points, I'm just going to stop and pray for us to specifically accomplish each one. I know that's a little bit different than what we are used to doing here, but that's okay. We want to take advantage of, in a good way, the things that God has allowed us to do. And that very first one is confidently, confidently draw near to God's throne. Guys, I don't think it's even possible to overstate what I'm about to say. Christians, Christ followers... We are so blessed to be able to come into the presence of God on an individual basis. We don't need a priest. We don't need burnt offerings. We don't need sin offerings. We don't need anything else but the name of Jesus. That's it. But how? How could sinners like you and me come so close to God like this? In the Old Testament, it was only the high priest of Israel that could go into that holy place 
called the Holy of Holies. There used to be this, this big veil, like a giant curtain that would separate this place from the rest of the tabernacle. And then later on when the temple was built, it would separate it from the rest of the temple. But when Jesus died, this real physical curtain was torn into from top to bottom. That was signifying two different things. Number one, nobody else could have torn that from top to bottom except God. And number two, Jesus' death gave us direct access to God the Father. Jesus' body and his blood are representative of that veil and representative of the blood sacrifices that used to be in the Old Testament. But his body and his blood is sufficient for all of us for all time, once for all. And then, verse 20 also says that there's a new and living way to get to God. So yes, Jesus' death did make this possible for us, but he didn't stay dead. That's the best news we have. This living way is much better than the old way of dead animals and their blood for sacrifice could ever be. So we may now approach God's throne boldly and confidently because of Jesus. But confidence does not mean arrogance. We can't come to God and just like expect him to do something for us for us because he owes us anything. We can't demand anything from God. Instead, this confidence that we have is from an understanding that no matter what it is that I do or have done, that doesn't change what has been done for me. And for you, by the way. Nothing we do can change that. And that kind of confidence should actually produce in us the opposite effect of arrogance. It should humble us. It should make us repentant of our sins. It should make us really want to be in that holy place more. And then, in the second half of verse 22, it talks about our hearts being sprinkled clean and our bodies being washed with pure water. This is not talking about literal things. We are not ripping open our hearts, our chests, to sprinkle anything on our hearts. And as we've talked about before, there is no physical water that can wash over our bodies and make us right with God. But we want to make sure that when we approach God, we do so confidently and sincerely with full assurance of the faith that we have in him. And this is the first place I want to just take a moment and pray for us to accomplish this specific thing. God, we thank you so much for the reminder this morning that it doesn't matter what we have done, what we did last week, what we may have done last night, even this morning, if we messed up, God, we can still come confidently before you if we have placed our faith in your son, Jesus. We just humbly ask you for your forgiveness and we thank you that Jesus' precious blood has been sprinkled on our hearts to make us clean, has washed our bodies. God, please continue to just remind us every day that we both can and need to draw near to your presence. Thank you for allowing us to do that. We ask you that you help us to do it sincerely. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then we move on to firmly grasp our hope. Now, you're going to laugh at me here, but when this picture comes up, I have some explaining to do. Okay. So, guys, uh, Friday I turned 31. And SpongeBob was one of the cartoons that I watched growing up. Now, you may not understand this at all. If you're a little younger than me or a little older than me, you might not get it. But if you do get it, I know you'll appreciate it. Essentially, uh, Patrick wants Squidward to hold the jellyfish net 
but he can't because he's in a full body cast. And he says, firmly grasp it. But a serious point to take away from this silly slide is that we not be so spiritually crippled that we can't firmly grasp the truth of our faith in Jesus. And guys, this could be an extremely long point for such a small verse. Christians, we profess something massive, okay? What we believe about Jesus affects the eternal destiny of people's souls. And I don't think there's a light way to say that at all. We have the answer to eternity in Jesus. So it's really important that we get on board with this and we understand what it is that we believe. Christianity's claim is naturally exclusivistic. That just means it's exclusive. It is the only way. There is no other way. And we get that straight from the words of Jesus himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Guys, I don't have to be a parent yet to understand that when you tell someone there is only one way to do something, they are immediately going to try to do it another way. They are going to try to prove you wrong. And that is a hundred times worse with the way the enemy tempts us and tempts other people to try to get to God. There are other ways. If you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. There are all kinds of ways that he will try to do that. But for us Christians who do make this claim, we will be mocked. We will be slandered and ridiculed and persecuted in all kinds of ways. The scripture says we need to do so without wavering. Yes, our claim is very bold, but the truth is true no matter if it's bold or ordinary. And if you feel the weight of whatever pushback you may be getting about your belief in Christianity, you just remember the promises that God has given to you because he's faithful to those promises. It's only a matter of time until he proves you correct in your faith. And this is where I want to show you Romans uh, actually, Romans 9, 33 and 10, 11, both quote from Isaiah. Here's Romans 10, 11. It says, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. And this word here is saying that they will not be put to shame. Your faith in God will not cause you shame by being proven incorrect because it is the truth. And I also like to point out that the word hope in the New Testament is not the idea of hope that we have today. The way we typically use hope is, I hope I win the lottery. I have like 0.0% chance of winning it, but I sure hope I do. But instead, hope is an expectation. Hope is an assurance. It is absolutely not a what if. Guys, Jesus is coming back. And everything that he promised is going to happen. It is expected and it is assured. That is our hope. So Father, we just ask for you to, to give us the courage to stand firm in our faith. To clinch this truth of your word and your Son, so tightly that we never let go. God, when the world is pressing in all around us and we have been pressed with a question that we don't know or uh, someone that is outside of the faith is, is pushing back against our faith, God, help us not waver from you. Help us to be winsome in those moments. Help us to remember your promises for us. God, help us to appropriately defend our faith and give good reasons for the hope that we have. God, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness. And we thank you for your promise that we will not be put to shame by our faith in you. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we move on to verse 24. This is provoking each other to love and good works. This one is funny to me because the word provoke or stimulate, as my version has it, it is actually used most of the time, if not every other time, for an angry kind of action. It is making each other angry. When Paul and Barnabas split ways, they had such a a strong disagreement that they parted ways and they, they did ministry apart. This is obviously not the context used here. It wouldn't make any sense to say we go and anger each other and disagree with each other so much that we turn around and go love and do good things. That doesn't make sense. So this author must have understood that you and me, we can forget how to, to, how to love. We can forget to do those good things. And in cases like this, there is a need for some ruffling of the feathers that should take place. Again, this isn't us pushing someone to anger, but it's that we spend time and put actual effort into thinking about how to push each other to continue living like a Christian should. Iron sharpens iron. A thriving, healthy community is going to push each other to be better than they were the next day. This isn't a judgmental thing. It's much more like an accountability partner type thing. But understand, or I understand that uh, sometimes you have close um, accountability partners that should probably be left to do those personal accountability checks on you with them. But this one is much more broad. This broad calling to love and good works can be done by all of us to all of us. So we should love each other enough. We should care about the church at large enough. And we should uh, have enough of a desire to see Jesus' representation here on earth be more like him. To push each other, to move the bar for, uh, for each of us to be more like him every single day. And so, God, once again, I understand that this was a small point to make, but the impact of it is so much larger than this sermon even has time to address. So, God, we just simply ask you that you energize us and you fuel our brains with the necessary creativity and the loving push to each other to push us out of our comfort zones and into the kind of love and good works that you have for all of us. We also don't ever want to act like we are immune to this need. So we ask that you would send someone our way today or this week who will be bold enough and willing enough to push us and just nudge us back into the place that we need to be. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then we move on to something I'm sure we've heard plenty times. Don't stop meeting together. This is the part of the verse where you're most likely and most often going to hear it preached. Don't stop coming to church. I've done that. Other pastors have done that. And that is correct. That is a correct application of this text. But I also want to point out here that this meeting together is the environment in which that last point is accomplished. We are to consider one another, provoking each other to love and good works, but the playground where that happens is the assembly of ourselves together. So again... Please listen to me here. If this place right here is the only time that you ever assemble with other believers, but you also show up late, you also jet out the door as soon as the pastor says amen, I have to tell you, I don't think you're spending enough time with that last point. And I also don't think 
you're going to have enough time to benefit from or do the next point. Now, if you happen to show up late today for the first time in your whole life, (laughs) I'm not ragging on you. If you have to leave today as soon as the service is over, I'm not going to have my binoculars out looking for you. But I do want to encourage you, provoke you even, to consider what these verses mean in the context of the body of Christ. As a body, we are not all feet or all hands or all arms or all legs. We are all different. And we all offer something different to each other. And when something is missing, we suffer. So if it is your normal practice to show up late, to leave early, let me just say I'm glad you're here in the first place. But I also want to encourage you to stick around and build some relationships here. We'll all be better for it. Don't punish yourself by going into solitary confinement away from the community that God has given for you to grow and thrive. And for some people, Sunday mornings aren't a possibility. They are not able to make it here, whether it's work or whatever the case may be. And listen, that's fine. You want to know why? Because the church is not this building. It is not any building. It is the collection of believers together. That's the church. Others, this one-time meeting on Sunday mornings isn't enough. We have plenty of other small groups and other kind of meeting times together to keep those relationships growing, to keep uh, healthy relationships that the church needs to function properly. I'll bring up uh, Dave Hatfield last week. He said his community has met together for almost 700 days in a row. Actually, I think it was more than that. They missed five days, he said, because they went to a pastor's conference And then his right-hand man, Wes, had a baby. But other than that, they met every single day. And he had several people who walked five miles to get there. Do we have that kind of hunger and passion to not stop meeting together? God, I pray that you would just light that kind of fire in us that makes us truly want to be together as a body of Christ. Teach us what it is to be your people by being with your people. God, help us to cherish this time that we have together and not treat it like a chore or a checklist or some kind of burden. God, we thank you for giving us this gift as another means of assistance and growth. Please don't let us take it for granted. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then our last point here, as we move into the second half of verse 25, is to encourage one another. I want to take two applications from this passage, or this half of passage right here. One of them is broad, and one of them is pretty direct. So here's the broad one. Far, 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 far from... The doomsday preaching that we so often hear when it comes to end times prophecy, the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, any other kind of end of the world language, Hebrews instead make very clear what we are supposed to do when we see those things. When we see the world progressing to the return of our Savior, we should encourage one another. It doesn't say go on fear-mongering. So when things are spinning savagely out of control in this world, we should encourage each other even more than what we normally do or should on a regular everyday basis. Remember what we talked about in the second point. Guys, a Christian's hope is not the kind that would say, well, we might have a way out of the darkness. 
or we think we know what happens to us when we die. No, we have been assured by God's word that our hope will not put us to shame. People who have that kind of hope, we have plenty to talk about. We have plenty to encourage people with, especially when the world is racing headfirst downhill. That gives us even more of a chance to talk about our hope. Now, I want you to imagine that for a second. Imagine a world where Christians were the ones who were calm and collected in the face of turmoil, not spreading chaos. Imagine Christians being the ones who are filled with and spreading peace in a time of fear and uncertainty. That would be a unique type of set-apartness that we would have. It's almost like God called us to that. He wants us to be set apart. Holy is what that word means. Holy means set apart. And a really good way for us to be set apart and really stand out is by being that one who is positive and peaceful and encouraging when everybody else is screaming their heads off. And then a more direct point here is that up to this point, the author has told us to draw near to God's throne, to hold fast the confession of our hope, and to consider how to stimulate each other to love and good works. And then he understands that you can't stimulate each other to love and good works unless you are together. So he says, make sure you don't fall into the bad habit of not meeting together like these other folks have. And instead, you should encourage each other. You groups of Christians who meet together, when you are together, encourage each other. Yes, there are plenty other things that we can and even should do when we are here together. We've done some of them today. We sang some songs. We prayed. We're listening to the Word of God being preached right now. But in particular, this author tells us that part of the meeting together of Christians should include encouraging one another. And just so we're aware that he is aware that there are outside circumstances that can influence us, he says, encourage each other even more when you see the day drawing near. Guys, we associate with very bad things that day that's drawing near. And there are reasons for that. The apocalyptic books in the Bible give us some really negative things that are signs for the day that's coming. Jesus himself gives us really negative things of the signs that that day is coming. He says there will be wars and rumors of wars. There there will be nation rising against nation, famines and earthquakes and hatred and false prophets and lawlessness. And all of these things are terrible. They're really bad. Raise your hand if you've seen this in the world today. Everyone that just raised your hand, you should encourage people more. More than that. So anytime... You hear someone bring these things up and they are discouraging. You should encourage them with the hope that you have. Do it to two people if one brings it up. If you hear about the hatred going on in the world, bring up two ways that love prevails over hate. And remember that your hope is an assurance It is not a what if. So God, please help us. Help us be an encouraging group of people. Your word is filled with things that will bring us peace, that will excite us for the future. Things that will eliminate the dread of our temporary circumstances. God, thank you for that. Give us discernment when to speak and what to say to boost all of us and those around us. 
Help us appropriately fill our time of here together. And thank you most of all that a day really is coming when you are coming back. We can't wait for that day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, it's my desire that you have been encouraged today, that you've gotten something from these five points that you can take and better your life and the lives of those around you. And if you need to improve in any of these areas, that's fine and dandy because I do too. It's all right. But you know what we can do about that? We can encourage each other to do better. And if there happens to be anyone in here this morning who does not have that kind of hope, that kind of assurance in the future, I beg you to please ask someone today. Just ask. Every single day that we get is another day closer we get to Jesus' return. And we want you to be fully assured in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We have plenty to tell you about him, and we would love to share. So I'm going to ask Don Randall to go ahead and come up and close us in prayer. And while he does that, uh, I just want to let you guys know, I'm going to be out in the lobby afterwards. We're also going to have uh, some prayer team members along the side walls as you walk out of here today. Just make sure that you go up and talk to them. Ask them questions. Have them pray over you or for you or whatever. And I'd like to challenge everybody in here today not to leave today without first encouraging someone with something. It doesn't have to be the deepest theological thing that you could possibly think of. Just let it be something simple, something positive before you walk out of here today. Because one of the reasons that we are gathered here is for encouragement. So Don... Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's do this. Boy, did God use Pastor Isaac today? Let's encourage him today. Wow. Wow. Boy, isn't that, what a wonderful sermon we had today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day you give us, boy, to hear all about you. And that, Father, the two things that we, two major things we learned today in this sermon is we can boldly come to the throne of grace and ask. And then we've learned how can we reach out to encourage one another. May today, may that be started today. May today we know that we can come to you boldly. And I'm sure there's folks in the in in this in here today that needs to hear from you that needs a touch from you and something that's going on in their life, may they boldly come to you and just ask, God, please be with me. And then, Father, as we leave this place today, may our paths cross with someone that we could be an encouragement to and just come along beside them. We love you and we thank you and look forward to what you've got in store for us this week. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>